like I've seen over the last two years, in particular three years, particularly in Canada and the US, that many political types are turning away from the legacy media and its emphasis on appearance to the new media and its ability to deliver content. And I think it will differentially reward people who are the real thing. It's very hard to be fake for two and a half hours on YouTube in a spontaneous conversation. You know, and I think the people who are inclined to be fake won't even do those interviews because they'll just exhaust themselves. So I think that's a very positive development. Now, you know, the sensorial tyrants might have a word or two to say about that. I mean, YouTube took down my interview with Robert Kennedy, which I'm very unimpressed by, given that it was, they did that during an active presidential campaign. And I think that was a traitorous act. So, but, but, Nonetheless, you know, there's lots of other avenues for communication and the censors haven't been able to shut down genuine dialogue and in, in fact, quite the contrary. I mean, Rogan in particular, he's a fascinating phenomenon because he did what he did pretty much by himself, right? He's got his producer, there's two of them. And all Rogan did was ask stupid questions, you know? When Bill C-16 came up, people wondered why I made such a big deal out of it. And the reason for me, well, first of all, I knew what it was gonna do, and it's done exactly what I knew it would do in, in, in the detail. I knew it would produce a psychological epidemic. I said that to the Senate. I could see it just as clearly as could be. Well, first of all, I'd have to be convinced that doing so would do more good than harm, and I don't believe that. And I, I think I'm actually in a reasonable position to, to to justify my claim, I think that the danger that's intrinsic to the law far outweighs whatever potential benefit it might produce, especially given that there's no hard evidence whatsoever for any benefit. There's no evidence that moving the language in a compelled manner in this direction is going to have any beneficial effect. We're supposed to assume that just because hypothetically the intent is positive, that the outcome will be positive. And any social scientist worth his or her salt knows perfectly well that that's rarely the case. And I knew that it was part and parcel of the process of the restriction of speech. And so those were the grounds on which I objected to it. And you might say, well, why did I object to it? And the answer is, I'm way more afraid of losing my tongue to the tyrant than of anything the government or the woke radicals could possibly do to me. Because I know how people get corrupted. And if you have any sense at all, if you know how people get corrupted, you'll be way more afraid of that than anything else. And so for me, it's, well, why do I say what I think? Because I know that the alternative is hell. And it's not like I think that. I know that. Like I know it as much as you could possibly know anything. I watched that in my clinical practice for decades. I saw it unfold in my personal life in all sorts of ways. I see it work in the political world. You lie at your peril. You have no idea what you'll pay for that. You have, and what everyone else will too. It isn't just that you take yourself to hell as you drag everyone along with you. Not good, not good. Well, well you don't have to say what you think about absolutely everything every second. You have a right to privacy and it's reasonable to be discreet. I don't think you should make unnecessary enemies, you know? Um, and then after that, well, if you falsify what you believe explicitly, that's a big mistake. Like I would say, you can make a blanket, you can just lay a blanket prohibition over that. Do not lie. And what, the, there's a, de, I could define that. Do not say things that you know, according to your own standards of truth, are false. That circumvents all the moral relativistic arguments. It's like everyone knows the difference between saying something they believe to be true and something they know to be false. Okay, so don't do that. Now, there's going to be edge cases when you don't know. It's like, well, maybe those are places you should, you know, explore carefully or just shut the hell up about. And then there's the more complex situations where you could say something, but you believe that it might be unwise under the circumstances. And I would say, well, those are very complex moral cases. So you might, you might say, well, look, I'm a teacher and I can't 
oppose the school board because I have four kids and, and my wife stays at home and we're solely dependent on my income. So it's the duty I owe my wife and my children compared to the duty I owe my profession and my society. And that's a real conflict of duty. It's a genuine conflict of duty. And the ethical pathway forward is not crystal clear in the manner that someone could specify from the outside. Okay, so if I have someone like that in my clinical practice, I say, well, look, you're going to be called upon to make very fine moral judgments. So you better make yourself into the person that can do that. And how do you do that? Well, you do that, first of all, by ceasing lying, right? Because then you sharpen your vision and then you'll be able to be in a situation where you can decide in a given circumstance which pathway forward is the most appropriate morally. Now, part of the reason, this is a crucial point, is that part of the reason that you should be careful with what you say is because, well, there's no difference between speaking and thinking. And if you muddy the conceptual waters and you find yourself in a tight spot, you'll be too blind to think. And then you'll be in trouble. And, you know, and not just the sort of trouble that can cause death, that trouble too, but worse. So if you know that and, and you've thought that through, it's like, oh, I see, I can't lie because if I lie, I falsify the process that enables me to abide by the truth. When the challenge arises, you think, oh, that seems rather self-evident. I should be careful because or else. And I know that. I, I know that. And I also know that if you are careful with what you say, especially that you don't lie, but also that you practice saying what you have to say when the time is right, then your vision gets sharper and the world improves around you and the opportunities multiply and, and everything works out for you much better, even though it's complex and for everyone else much better. That's how the world works.